compelling. You'd have to see this talk with such a title. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so excited for this. This is very much in my wheelhouse. So we have got um, with the Archaeology of Dark Souls, we're welcoming um, Tom Keep, an Archaeology PhD candidate, and Mia Ni, nee, a creative writer, both from the Uni of Melbourne. So take it away. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our talk on the Archaeology of Dark Souls. Um, this talk will perhaps be a bit more lighthearted than the others, which I sometimes think is a bit nice in a multi-day conference, but I sincerely do believe it has some points to make about how to effectively represent material culture through digital environments in a way that fosters engagement and inspires contemplation of the meaning of objects within a digital world. So as a bit of background, um, the intersection between video games and cultural heritage has long been established with many major titles in the last decades, using historical contexts as the foundation of their stories. Much ink has already been spilled on the legitimacy of these representations and on how these representations will influence the understanding of the past in future generations. Today, we'd like to focus on Dark Souls, a game which does not attempt to represent any human past, but still presents a mode of understanding the past, which should be of interest to archeologists invested in digital representations of heritage. Video games have a relatively short media history, and many games have only recently begun to explore the potential for effective and unique means of interactive storytelling. Part of the reason we would like to discuss Dark Souls in relation to knowledge production and distribution comes from my understanding of archaeology as an active pra practice of discovery, rather than an exclusively passive, cumulative, or analytic process. While analysis of literature, accumulation of data, or the reception of scholarship are of course integral to the field, what makes it unique as a form of knowledge production is that it is a practiced, involved experience of making sense through discovery, constructing contexts for comprehending the meaning of material and iteratively re-evaluating the frameworks of interpretation. While there are many means by which to convey our interpretations of the meaning of archeological materials, Without the active experience of participation and discovery, the true comprehension of the material is difficult to offer. I would like to argue that Dark Souls is one of a rare set of video games that thoroughly understands its own medium and integrates the meaning of its message inextricably into its formal mechanics. That medium is the active process of exploration, discovery, contextual inference, and analysis of material culture within the game world in a process which has resonated with me personally as more akin to the practice of archaeology than any other form of media I have personally experienced. So I'll start by introducing the Dark Souls franchise to the non-gamers of our audience. Um, the franchise consists of several games produced by the Japanese studio From Software under the magnificent direction of our Lord and Saviour Hidetaka Miyazaki. We'll come back to Miyazaki later in the presentation, but he's a notable poster boy for a growing or two theory of game design. The games are a fantasy action role-playing series where you fight your way through a series of lost heroes, fallen gods, and chaotic monsters. Remarkably, we're far from the first to have made the connection between Dark Souls and archaeology. In 2012, a year after the release of Dark Souls 1, Forbes magazine published an article discussing how the way information is conveyed in the game is most akin to archaeology. Nine years later, this concept is still being discussed with Bill Farley, an Associate Professor of Anthropology and Archaeology at the Southern Connecticut State University, releasing a series of YouTube video essays discussing archaeological concepts through video games, the majority of his channel discussing the Dark Souls series. So why is this connection made with Dark Souls in particular? What is it about these games that attracts comparisons to archaeology as a mode of inquiry? There are three concepts from the games we would like to discuss, which not only serve to legitimate the comparison, but by investigation may also teach us how to make more engaging digital gamified representations of human heritage. Uh, now, as much as we would like to spend many hours discussing the lore of Dark Souls, as indeed I have in the past, I'll spare you my ramblings as much as possible. Um, however, in order to understand the means by which Dark Souls reveals information in an archeological fashion, some explanation of the setting and in-game history of the title is necessary. I'd like to hand over to my friend and fellow Dark Souls scholar, Mia Nee, to discuss some of these ideas. Thank you very much, Thomas. 
Uh, so the mythic history of Dark Souls takes cues from various world mythologies, uh, particularly Greco-Roman and Norse mythology. Uh, it recalls a cyclical and epochal view of time um, inspired by something akin to the ages of man in uh, Hesiod's works and days. Uh, Dark Souls is set in uh, a kingdom called Lordrin, which is the kingdom of the gods, long after it has fallen into disrepair. Its world is one of repeated cycles of ruin and renewal as different empires of dragons, gods, and humans vie for hegemony. The game's present day takes place at the closing of what's called the Age of Fire, which is an epoch defined by the rule of a pantheon of gods headed by an old father figure called Lord Gwyn. We're gonna come back to this pantheon later on, uh, but Gwyn is a fire of, uh, sorry, Gwyn is a god of fire and sunlight and his waning influence in the world is represented as a literal fading of his flames. Uh, the objective of the game is to fight through some of this pantheon and to claim their power and ultimately choose whether to use that power to prolong the Age of Fire or usher in the Age of Dark, which is the epoch of mankind. Uh, Dark Souls' thematic focus on psychos of destruction and regeneration allows for an exploration of in-game history through visiting different time periods, uh, witnessing the shadowing phantoms of known figures from ages past, and uh, it serves to make the connection between the past and present feel visceral and immediate. Uh, the present requires the player to understand the past to consider why things, places, and people are the way they are and how they came to be. An example of this storytelling through player discovery is found in the game's architecture. Because Dark Souls is a game, the player interacts with its world through its levels, that is, its physical architectural spaces. One of the core objectives of this kind of game is to familiarize yourself with the level design, and Dark Souls chooses to encourage this by using architectural landmarks such as bridges, aqueducts, cisterns, and sewage systems as objects that the player can orient themselves against in the world. In other words, the narrative experience is folded into the gameplay experience. Both of them require the player to understand the space around them and navigate that. Dark Souls conveys its history by taking cues from world architecture. Through the course of the game, different architectural styles are used to convey a sense of cultural transition and progress. The earliest areas feature the Romanesque architecture of the High Middle Ages with towers, parishes, and crumbling aqueducts. The blocky visual quality of this architectural style also suits the gameplay objectives of these introductory levels, as the player can clearly identify parts of the level by their functional uses. For example, um, a player might find themselves on a bridge between two towers that leads into a storeroom, which leads to a set of stairs up to a small plaza adjacent to our guard tower and some scaffolding. Later in the game, the player visits a location called Anor Londo, which is uh, the city of the gods, where the architecture has notably transitioned into the Gothic architecture of the late Middle Ages and the early Renaissance. From a gameplay perspective, the more intricate nature of Gothic architecture complements the level design's increasing complexity as the player is tasked with more and more difficult feats of navigational problem solving. The architecture of Anor Londo was directly inspired by that of Milan Cathedral, which you can see on screen, as well as other notable pieces of Renaissance construction, uh, such as the stairwell from the 16th century Chateau de Chambord in France. These elements create the impression of a period of time. The player is then trusted to make inferences about the meaning of this transition from medieval to Renaissance architecture and what it signifies for the game's story. Namely, that the gods are the world's ruling class and that their city is a place of wealth and prosperity, a place that has access to more architectural technologies, that has a higher volume of cultural and decorative output, and that possesses a centralized state power required to assemble a workforce to build it in an organized fashion. None of this information is explicitly stated through the dialogue or the written text of the game, but it's implied by the design of the world itself. Its meaning must be inferred through analysis of material remains, which is left entirely to the player community and the players themselves to construct. The transitions in architectural style and environment may be considered the macro history of the game world. But embedded within the architecture are also clues for the reading of temporally smaller historical events, which we might term micro histories of the game world. 
One such example is the story of a character named Black Iron Tarkus. Uh, Tarkus is first encountered at the gates leading to Anor Londo, and players must seek his assistance, overcoming the enemies that guard the entrance. He disappears after this encounter, but on reaching Anor Londo, the player may discover a smashed window on the upper floor of a cathedral that allows them to enter from the outside and make their way down to the ground level by way of the ramparts, where they find a body in the corner bearing the armor of Tarkus. Without any dialogue, the player learns something of Tarkus through where he is encountered and infer what his personal journey may have been. We can infer that Tarkus was also on a journey to Anolondo, reached it first of his own accord, broke the cathedral window to gain entry, but fell from the ramparts to his death, um, possibly due to his heavy armor. None of this is ever confirmed, and many of the highly invested player community debate this interpretation. But the key point is that players are offered evidence by which they may interpret the actions of the past through contextual consideration of material remains. The architecture of the game world is also used to hint at other micro histories. Uh, much is known about Lord Gwyn and his image is frequently seen immortalized in sculpture within Anolondo. Less, however, is known about the figures of his wife and his firstborn son. What we know of them is inferred through the presence and the conspicuous absence of their sculptural representations in the game. There are a total of three statues within the game featuring a woman holding a child, and Gwyn is known to have had three children within the established law of the first game. All of the statues are within, are within religiously titled areas in the game, Violin Shrine, the Sunlight Altar, and the Undead Parish. But none are found within Anolondo, suggesting that they were deliberately expunged from the city following a schism or disruption of the royal family. Regarding the firstborn son, it is the deliberately conspicuous absence of sculptural representations which provide the player with an understanding of the deep lore of the game. We know from the description of miracles within the game that the firstborn son of Gwyn was the god of war, and from the description of the ring of the son's firstborn that he committed a grave error which led to the rescinding of his deific status and his removal from the annals of history. Within Anolondo, there are grouped recesses for statues of the royal family, persistent with one, persistently with one statue removed from its niche. The player infers from the material remains that there was a state-sanctioned process of Demnatio Memoriae undertaken within the capital, following the practices of Pharaonic Egypt or Imperial Rome. Just like within those cultures, it could well be argued that the conspicuous absence of the statues of the firstborn son is used not to eradicate the memory of them, but to immortalize their shameful expulsion from royalty. Only on one occasion do we find a statue of the firstborn son that has not been removed, the sunlight altar. Here, the statue is in a state of disrepair, but remains in place. There are only a few worshippers left bowing in prayer to the fragments. The remnants of the statue implies two things about the social and religious order of the game world. It implies that the administrative reach of Anolondo is limited to the capital, and that religious practice was continued in worship of the old gods outside the city walls. We want to draw special attention to the way that Dark Souls approaches items. Because the objective of the game is partly to level up your character and grow stronger, uh, accumulating items is an important part of the game design. These games, uh, sorry, these items typically have a functional value, such as weapons and armor that you can equip, um, but they're also contextualized as artifacts of material culture for the purposes of player immersion. All items found, gifted, or purchased within the game are accompanied by two pages of information. On one page, we can find a functional description of the use value of the object, while the other page provides a longer and a more flavorful description of the item, frequently implying or alluding to its status within the lore and history of the game world. Uh, quite importantly, the design of the levels and the copy used in item descriptions were personally overseen by the game's director, Hidetaka Miyazaki, in recognition of the significance of the message of the game. Understanding the story and how items are placed, where we can find them, and how they're described within the world is arguably the most representative of the practice of archaeological inference. Objects within Dark Souls are presented as simultaneously functional and meaningful, similarly to how one would conceive of a piece of pottery or worked stone in the archaeological record. The flavor text and item descriptions is also often incomplete. The meaning of written descriptions can be misleading or allude to a greater significance which requires consideration of the surrounding context to fully comprehend. 
Tom just gave the example of how the description of the ring of the sun's firstborn gives a historical context for why certain statues have been expunged from the game's architecture. In another example, a giant enemy watches over a stone plinth bearing a corpse. The corpse is wearing a set of clothes whose description tells us that they belonged to a mythic character, one of another pantheon of legendary siblings. The enemy watching over the plinth will attack the player if they disturb the corpse upon it. Later, the player may find another item below the cliff this enemy stands over, a ring whose description states that it was gifted to its original owner by his sisters, but fool that he is, he readily dropped it. From the placement and description of these two separate items, the player is able to infer a micro history. The enemy is the original owner of the ring, one of the pantheon of legendary siblings, and he is guarding the tomb of the sister who gifted to it gifted it to him. And the player is also expected to retain this information in their mind for hours before finding these separate pieces of information. These examples are only a few select excerpts from the first game. There are hundreds of other areas, items, and character micro histories dispersed throughout the franchise. Hopefully we've given you a sense of the degree of narrative complexity found in these games and their relevancy to archaeology, and also why there's such an engaged community of fans. One of the, um, all of the examples we've given weren't discovered by the two of us. This knowledge was discussed and shared on fan forums, in comment sections, and through video essays from dedicated fans interested in unpacking the game's cryptic lore. Speaking personally, this was actually my entry into the game community, which I've been part of for 10 years now. My first encounter was with lore forums, and I used to make videos of my own dissecting game architecture and micro histories, which you can see on the screen at the moment. Um, the community continues to have robust lore discussions over a decade after the first game's release, as subsequent entries in the franchise have added to or amended the narrative, proving or disproving certain theories and forming new connections as the game's world evolves. New methodologies and sources have also been developed, and the community's focus uh, has shifted from trying to interpret the internal logic presented within the games to understanding the, the, the development history of the games themselves. As an example, concept art from the first Dark Souls shows an unused sequence in which statues depicting the mother and child found uh, in the final game play a greater narrative role. And players have inferred from this that uh, these statues and the figures they depict may have had more significance to the game's story at an earlier point in development. Some community members have even hacked into the game's files to reveal hidden information and deleted characters, which were only meant for the developer's eyes. Others still have taken a historiographic interest in chronicling the history of the community itself, how knowledge was discovered and shared within the community, and how our communal understanding of the games has expanded to include a greater scope of technical expertise, including the coders who have broken into the game's files, and the archaeologists and historians who have used their technical knowledge to compare in-game theories with real history. In this way, the fan community of Dark Souls is engaged in a live conversation as new developments and methodologies lead to new knowledge and understandings, a conversation that mimics archaeology itself as an evolving field of inquiry. Got two minutes left. Okay. The very act of interpretation seems to be an essential element of the meaning of the game for its director. In an interview with The Guardian, Miyazaki discussed how his particular method of storytelling was inspired by reading Western novels. With his imperfect English comprehension, he would often miss important narrative detail, but infer what had happened from the behavior of later characters and develop his own interpretations of what had occurred in the interim, a process he considered to be a form of co-authorship. Archaeology and historical interpretations may similarly be conceptualized as a process of co-authoring historical narratives. The cultural historian Hayden White contended that historical truth is the product of narratives constructed by historians. Historical knowledge is not a truth discovered of the past, but a narrative produced through discourse and interpretation. History is in effect a series of described events set in the past used to provide a sense of meaning to reality. I would like to argue that archaeology is particularly well described by this perspective, with a narrative of place and time constructed in co-authorship between researchers and objects. And to be clear, I don't mean this as criticism, I think that this process of revelation and creation is what makes archaeological discoveries so emotionally investing. The sense of emotional weight an object biography is able to elicit is what makes a field so interesting. 
As many are seeking new means of conveying archaeological narratives and knowledge using digital media, it is wide to regard the accomplishment of digital artists and game designers as inspiration for how to foster emotional responses to representations of the past. I would like to argue that Dark Souls has accomplished this outcome with more success than any widely popular video game on the market. The game was released 10 years ago, but still enjoys the interest of a large and dedicated fan base deeply invested in presenting their understandings of the material culture in the game, offering considered evidence-based arguments for the contrasting understandings of the meaning of the items and how they relate to history. To put it another way, it's the only fan community I'm familiar with where footnoting your arguments to, return, to refer to material culture from the game is standard practice. In my own research into the applications of digital representations of heritage, I'm attempting to apply forms of knowledge production and information distribution inspired by those used in Dark Souls. Dark Souls understands that a sense of understanding and emotional investment into the meaning of material culture is most impactfully conveyed when the information provided requires consideration of why the object is where it is. And I'm asks really sorry, audience, Tom. I'm so uh, I've got one more slide. One, one more slide, yeah, okay. real quick. Uh, in my reconstruction of a 19th century mill cottage in rural Victoria, placing 3D modeled reconstructions of artifacts uncovered in excavation into the scene and providing just enough associated contextual information through pop-up windows, effectively item descriptions, for users to infer my, their meaning for themselves. It would be arrogant to believe this is the last slide, that archaeologists looking to use digital media to represent <laughs> heritage environments naturally have the required skill sets to make digital representations of material culture engaging. Rather, we should look to experts in designing digital environments and learn what techniques they have developed to add emotional weight to the constructed material culture. I believe the Dark Souls is among the best examples of using interactive digital media in the interest of conveying a meaningful message through material culture, and that a consideration of the game can provide us with the following guidelines for creating an engaging and informative experience. Trust your audience's intelligence, imply information rather than stating it, avoid authoritative statements of truth, build information into the world itself, and incentivize consideration of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was super cool, super, super cool. What can I say? I could talk about this with you guys forever. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'll open it up real quick. We have someone saying Elder Scrolls uh, law and archeology span is better. So we can uh, let you have a bit of a tussle in the comments about that. <laughs> I do have a question for you guys. I have many. Um, <laughs> incorrect, yeah. Um, so I see this kind of environmental storytelling in a lot of games, like Dark Souls and Elder Scrolls, definitely series. <laughs> I'm just laughing at this disagreement, sorry. Um, definitely do it, do it some of the best. But what I often notice is that this sort of environmental storytelling is pretty opt in um, in the way that the games are designed. So uh, it's up to the player how much they actually want to engage in the sort of lore and the backstory. Because um, what's really happening here, and I think what you got across in your presentation is that really they're doing a form of historical thinking without really realizing it. Um, but they may not actually choose to engage in the law that much. So do you feel like this is a problem um, that needs to be overcome? Or is it okay to sort of just let people engage to the extent that they want to engage in? Or do you think that maybe some games are designed in a way where you sort of have to engage in the law, or you sh they should be designed in that way? I mean, I guess it depends what you're aiming for with the audience. I would say for this game in particular, it makes it better. Because so many people don't notice what's going on. They just play through the game, much as, you know, a lot of people don't pay attention to human history, they just accept things as the way they are. And then when you discover this, when someone points it out to you, um, your appreciation of it becomes a lot richer. But if you were trying to design a game experience purely for the sake of education, then it's probably not wise to hide the, these um, discovery elements. Yeah, I would agree with that. Although um, I think that um, having, striking that balance of subtlety of having sort of having to work to find information is ultimately what fosters like a, a close engagement with the, yeah. uh, the media core. And that's why the community sort of is so robust. Yeah, I completely agree that. And that's the most exciting thing to me is that by allowing, trusting your audience to discover it for themselves and engage with it, that's where you get that real engagement. That's so cool. And I, I wish that we could get the public to sort of dig into actual historical um, events as deeply as they do into Dark Souls, hacking into things to find hidden information and stuff like that.